I'm going to talk to you about 20 years of trust. And I'm going to tell you that we started with the battle in Seattle in 99. Show of hands, how many of you remember that? Good. I knew you were there probably marching. Um, but the key point about that was globalization. And the first sign that, in fact, um, non-governmental organizations were the most trusted institution uh, above media, government, and business. And we kept going through the Iraq war, which uh, cost government uh, trust. Then the Great Recession, which uh, really provoked people to question whether business had the right motives and the right ability. Then we started to have social platforms and trust moved from top down to horizontal, peer to peer. But what I want to uh, also observe is that the consequences of those events, also including the rise of India and China, uh, in particular the rise of a billion people out of poverty um, in the first decade, had knock-on effects in the second. That the waves of the tsunami started to come faster and faster. And the first big wave was the mass class divide. That opinions of the elites diverged from those of the mass population starting in about 2013, 2014, when people woke up and realized that what had happened in 2008 was significant in that it actually provoked the rise of the 1%. <laughs> it didn't allow the recovery necessarily of everybody else. The second was uh, the important um, of fake news polluting the ecosystem, and people could have no kind of sense of reliable facts. The third was that government, which came to the rescue in 2008, disappointed in 2011 in Brussels, in the Greek debt, and then in Washington, the impasse, and then in developing markets, the whole series of corruption scandals from Brazil to South Africa, et cetera, that disabled government and creates a 50-point gap between business and government in developing markets. And then we also had um, this unbelievable new development in the two, last two years, which is that trust has become local. That my employer becomes the single most trusted institution in the world, 20 points higher than business. So a sort of quick snapshot of the state of affairs in trust is that you have business for the first time passing NGOs in trust. This has been a long recovery from 2008. Appreciate the significance of this. It's the first time in 20 years this has happened. NGOs have always been on the top. The second is that um, both media and government are at pretty low ebb. Media is a little bit like an airplane that's running out of gas. It goes for a while and then starts to sort of fade and then sort of fades quickly. And it's particularly because of social media. I want to reiterate that it's mostly a phenomenon in Western countries, but social media is at 25% trust or lower in the UK, US, France, Germany, et cetera. Fake news, problems of political advertising. We can debate those. Also, importantly, government is at low ebb. It's not universally true. In the East, in China, in India, in countries that are economically successful, people buy into the theory of those governments. They tend not necessarily to be so democratic, the truth is that democratic countries perform worse in terms of trust in government and trust in media. Note that there's an identity of interest between media and government in China. It's hard to tell the difference. Um, so I've given you a quick uh, overview. Now I want to go to the data for 2020. The first point to observe is that the mass class divide is metastasized. Appreciate that it only was in the US, UK, and France three years ago. Today, we see more than 10-point gaps in almost every country. It's even in countries like China and India. It's 21 points in Saudi Arabia. It's 20 points in Germany. It's 20 points in egalitarian Canada. The mass class divide is serious, and I'll get to the reasons for it now. It's because fears are eclipsing hopes. Appreciate that. The level of fear is so significant that in every developed country, every developed country, we observe that most people believe that their incomes will be lower in five years from now. 
in two-thirds of the countries, so this is outside of developed countries now, in half of the developing markets, people also observe, a majority, that their social positions are being denigrated, that they're going down in terms of status, that they're afraid of losing position. Explains a lot. They also don't have confidence in their leaders. Two-thirds of people said, our leaders don't get it. They can't lead us through this stuff. That's really bad. On top of that, three-quarters of people say, I'm afraid of fake news. I can't get to the truth. So imagine this ecosystem of, I'm losing my economic position. I'm losing my social position. I don't know what truth is, and my leaders are weak. Now, let's put on top of this, 80% plus of people are afraid of losing their job in the next decade because of, one, gig economy, two, automation, three, globalization, or outsourcing. They have a huge level of fear about job loss. They don't feel they have the skills necessary to compete. And these fears are actually contributing to a general sort of dizziness. The way I would describe it is um, you just don't have solid ground. You, you feel as if you're in, I don't know, a carnival and you're on one of those machines that's kind of making you feel, you know, upset. And, and, and that's, that's the, the sense of, 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 I don't know, vertigo that, that people are having in, in the world. Now, when you have vertigo, you have a tendency to reach for short-term solutions. And that's really what we observe at the moment. But it also causes you to question the traditional means by which you've reached trust. So Francis Fukuyama, a brilliant political scientist in the early 90s, declared the end of history. And the end of history was premised on the fall of the Soviet Union, the rise of liberal democracies, that in fact, the system that we Americans, you Brits, have benefited from was the right one. We had rising economic tide, we had a strong social contract, and we had excellent judicial system, good legal structure. And his premise was, that's the way forward. Good economy, good life, good trust. And that worked for 30 years. And that time is over. There's a new construct for trust that we're going to propose today. And it actually requires more than Fukuyama. It requires that you're competent, but moreover, it requires that you have ethical behavior. We have now tracked 60 companies for the last three years, and here's what we've found. Competence is important. It's a necessary component. It's the x-axis. But the y-axis is ethical behavior. And ethical behavior is three words. It's integrity, it's dependability, and it's purpose. Purpose is the least of it. Dependability is the second least, and integrity is half of trust. So when you're in a country like Germany, as I was yesterday, Dieselgate, in your number one industry, undermines the very foundations of trust. It makes it impossible for people to believe you especially when it doesn't just happen in Volkswagen, it happens in Porsche, and it happens in Audi, and it happens in BMW, all of which is covered over by corporate executives and not discovered by government. I also want to put out there that the tech industry is the poster child today for what I'm talking about. Tech has been the saint industry. For 20 years, it's been the number one. One third of the countries today, tech has lost that position. And tech has lost that position, first of all, because it's seen as causing the world to go too quickly, makes me nervous. But it's also because government can't keep up with tech. Two thirds of people say government regulators don't understand enough about tech in order to regulate it. So that's pretty bad. But tech's also failing the basic lesson of accepting government. And tech is also refusing to accept its public responsibility in some cases. I won't go into specifics. We can discuss that later. But 
the basic question of, is it good for society? And is the business being run ethically or is it simply for selfish benefit is the core question. So now I wanna shift into a hypothesis which is it is up to business to lead. And business has to do it because government at the moment in many countries is disabled by fighting, by populism, by short-termism. And business needs to do it also because trust, again, is local. 90% of people tell us they want CEOs to stand up and speak up on the issues of the day. Why? Because they feel leaders aren't. And again, in a full employment economy, if I don't agree with the company, I leave. And why should companies do this? It's not for shareholders. Again, 90% of people told us stakeholder not shareholder. There may be Wall Street or Fleet Street people in the room. That's fine. Appreciate by almost nine to one, people say to us, it's customers, it's employees, it's communities. Here's the rationale for customers. Two thirds of people today are belief driven buyers. They will buy a brand only if they think the brand's standing with him or her. And again, you don't have to accept the politics behind the Nike ad, but understand the genius of it. You act like a startup, you'll get startup kind of velocity in your brand. You'll become important talk value, and you'll be seen as leading, not lagging. Employees, though, become the central focus of trust. Appreciate that trust is built from the inside out. Three quarters of people who are employees of companies said, I expect to have a voice. I expect to be heard. The Greta Thunberg concept of protest is happening at companies. Happened at Google, happened at Salesforce, happened at Nike, happens all over the place because people are not gonna be at a company which doesn't stand for them. Value and values. So the reason that companies need to lead now is customers and employees. Let me try and bring this all together. The biggest shocker of our statistics this year is a majority of people told us, 56%, I believe that capitalism is causing more harm than good in the world. That's a stunner. From the end of history to 56%, that's a 30-year journey. Trust is an essential component of regaining the momentum for a market system. And that same majority questions the value of a democratic system. We now have two models. We have state capitalism and we have the democratic free markets approach. It's down to business to prove that that system can work for all. Because when 75% of people say that the system doesn't work, it's not fair, and that fairness has become the number one determinant of whether a country can trust, we have a completely different equation. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the story of Trust 2020. Thank you.